Engaging with music, whether it's listening to it or creating it, is one of life's great joys. Alina, could you get through a whole day without listening to some music? No, it's my filler for everything that I do. As it is for me, I really do not think I could get through a single day without listening to some music. Humans have a deep emotional connection to music, but just how does music affect our mood and how does our mood affect the music we listen to or the music we create? We're getting into the links between music and emotion. It's episode 19 of Sister Doctor Squared. Hello everyone and welcome and as always we would like to acknowledge the Turrbal and Jagara people as the traditional owners of the land where we are recording this episode. We are coming to you from Yandan country and we pay our respects to Elders past and present and to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people listening today. Janine, how are you? Oh, uh, well, you know, but I'll I'll share with the listeners. I'm just stupid tired because I was at the emergency vet until quite late last night because my lovely dog decided to eat the ball of aluminium foil that I collect to recycle. So The dangers of recycling. Oh, far out. Yeah, I try to do the right thing and look what happens. And I will pass on, Alina, I haven't told you this, but when the when everything was done, thankfully they made they they were able to induce the material to come out. Let's just say that. <laughs> and she's fine. And um, so they had her in a cage just while they were reversing that medicine. And she just refused to come out of the cage when it was time to go home. And the vet came out and said, she just, she just wouldn't come out. I've not seen this. Like most dogs are really excited to come out and be with their people. I'm like, did she have a strong freeze response? And she's like, yes, that's what it was. I'm like, mm-hmm, I know all about yep. this. So we nerded out about that. So I thought I'd share that with the squares. Well, she's comfortable in a cage, unfortunately. Well, this is true. (sighs) Instead of my dog ate my homework, it's my dog ate my recycling. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. She has eaten my child's homework multiple times and I have to send photos to the teachers just to legitimise this excuse. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's awesome. Ah, yes. Very good. Well, despite your tiredness, we have an excellent episode for you. It's all about music. And I believe we mentioned, I think in the Muck Up Day episode, we talked about doing an episode around music. I think it was music and memory. Well, we're not doing that. This is music and emotion. (laughs) So it's in the same universe. If we um, look at the list, we have loads of music related episodes to do. Right. So stay tuned for those, but let's do this one. (laughs) Exactly. So I found a article to a really interesting study recently, which I'm going to talk about. So that's really what sparked this particular music episode. Yeah, that's right. So shall we get into it? Let's do it. Well, as you said, Janine, music definitely does impact our emotions. And in Western culture, we have a pretty good collective agreement on what we think is happy music and what we think is sad music. And we tend to experience major harmonies and melodies as happy and minor harmonies and melodies as sad. Janine, do you know the difference between major and minor harmonies and melodies? No, I have no musical training. I love music, but I don't know any of the terminology. (laughs) That's okay. You probably know more than you think (laughs) just through experience. But if you're not familiar with the difference between major and minor sounds, we'll put up a really nice demonstration that I found on YouTube. So have a look at that. But in essence, major chords tend to sound brighter and minor chords tend to sound darker and a bit more moody. A minor chord like A minor is like a sad, moody version of A major. Okay. So it's similar, but it's just slightly different. Okay. But like I said, when it comes to what we experience as happy and sad, this collective agreement might be the case in Western culture, but whether other cultures experience music in this same way is debated. Oh, okay. So I looked at a new study from this year, 2022, by Smit, Milne, Savassi and Dean. These are researchers from Germany and Australia, and the study was published in PLOS One. They wanted to test whether the effects of music on human emotion is universal. Mm. Now, a universal effect of music on emotion would mean there's something intrinsic in the music that leads to the same emotional reaction in all of us, no Mm. matter where we're from and what music we've been exposed to during our life and, you know, what prior associations we might have with different types of music. So how do you test this? 
Well, they went to remote regions of Papua New Guinea and did an experiment across seven villages in the region. These communities you can only reach by small plane or by days of hiking. These communities are entirely self-sufficient. There's no electricity. There's no regular access to mass media. Their traditional music is similar across the communities and it's very different in structure compared with Western music. So their traditional music, Janine, would probably sound really foreign to people mm-hmm. like you and me. Yeah, okay. Through missionary programs and church involvement, the villagers have had varying exposure to Western music and the people in these villages were grouped by their level of exposure. So there were three groups. There was one group that had very little exposure to Western music. There was one group that had regular exposure to major harmonies and melodies, but little exposure to minor ones. And then the third group had exposure to more diverse harmonies and melodies and had less exposure to the traditional music of the region. So what the researchers did was they played pairs of major and minor harmonies and melodies to 170 of these people in the Papua New Guinea villages and asked them for each pair, which made them feel happier. Mm. They did this same experiment in 60 non-musicians in Sydney, Australia. These were uni students and 19 trained musicians also in Sydney, Australia. Mm -hmm. So these Sydney participants are those with obviously a lot of exposure to Western music. Yep. What they found was that for harmonies, In every group except the one with minimal exposure to Western music, people felt more happiness following the major harmonies. Mm -hmm. And this effect was strongest for the Sydney participants. Mm -hmm. Again, these, these are the people with the most exposure to Western music. And for melodies, the Sydney participants and only one of the groups from the Papua New Guinea communities felt more happiness with major melodies than minor melodies. Hmm. So... What this means is that the researchers did not find clear evidence that we all react the same way to major and minor harmonies and melodies and that universally people just feel happy from major harmonies and melodies and sad from minor ones. Mm -hmm. So instead, this effect where it does exist could come down to cultural influences. Mm, That's what it's sounding like. Yeah. Yeah. Now, these cultural influences could be because of two things they talk about. One being association. Mm -hmm. So over time, we have come to learn that minor harmonies and melodies seem to go along with Mm -hmm. sad things. Mm -hmm. We see this in movies, other media, and in our own traditions in Western culture, Mm -hmm. right? What type of music do you Mm. you generally hear getting played at a funeral compared with at a New Year's Eve party? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So during a death scene in a popular soap opera, we don't hear La Bamba. (laughs) We don't hear a bit of 99 mm. red balloons being played during a brutal wartime battle. No. Yeah, like when we're watching a movie, they might be the token tearjerker. But what you're saying is maybe that's because we've culturally associated that sort of song with that sort of scene. Well, we have, mm. right? Yes. Do you like the 99 red balloons song? I do. I don't mind a bit of 80s pop. It's classic. I like the German one, the yeah, 99 oh, yeah. Luft- You've got to go to the classic German version, of course. <laughs> You'll have to put that on the playlist. Okay, making so, a note. Thank you. <laughs> now, this effect of association most definitely influences how we experience music in Western cultures. We've just been talking about, as does the second mode of influence, which is familiarity. So music that we've heard before and know well, we tend to prefer. And so we associate oh, yeah. this with more happiness. Oh, yeah, that is a good point. Yeah. The researchers think that this is the best explanation for why some of the Papua New Guinea participants did feel more happiness from the major harmonies and melodies, not because they have learned associations through media and other sources that Mm -hmm. major is happy and minor is sad, because remember they don't have access to Mm. such media, but because they've just heard these major harmonies and melodies more often. So if you recall, one Uh of the groups in the Papua New Guinea participants had exposure to Western music, but it was mostly major harmonies and melodies, which they'd been exposed to through Lutheran hymns. Yeah, okay. So it's possible that they preferred this simply because they're more familiar with it. Mm. 
Yeah, that makes sense. It might still be the case that if we did more studies like this with other communities too, that we could find that music does have universal intrinsic effects on the brain. The researchers couldn't rule this out in their study. And actually they did use a particular method of statistical analyses that is better for when you want to look at the evidence for the absence of an effect, Uh which is much harder to do than to look for evidence for an effect but they still couldn't rule out that music has universal effects. Okay. I mean, I don't know. I I think it's got to be cultural to a large extent. Yeah, well, I mean, I do like a little bit of death metal, for example. And Oh, yeah, we both do. I mean, a lot of people would not like that, and that's fair enough. And it generally makes me feel quite energised and good. But I can imagine other people might not feel that way. And that's part of my culture, I guess. We grew up with that. We had a lot of very heavy (laughs) rock being played in our household as kids. One thing that I think is really important to talk about is one of the limitations of this study. As they talk about in the paper, even doing a study like this, you're applying a very Western approach to gathering information. These people in the Papua New Guinea villages wouldn't be familiar with even the concept of asking the same question over and over again and being asked for their opinion about different Mm. stimuli. Yes, that's a good point. Yeah, this is a very Western paradigm of carrying out research. Mm -hmm. The researchers did put some measures in place to maximise the Papua New Guinea participants' understanding of at least what they were being asked to do. Yeah, I was just going to ask you that. Okay. So they had a translator and the questions were phrased using the sentence structure that fits with their native language. I Uh found this part of the paper quite interesting actually because the way they were asked the question was phrased in a way that sounds really bizarre to English speakers. Of course. But there's still a broader issue in trying to understand something about one culture using the methods developed by another culture. Yeah, yeah. So there's a little bit more about that in the article that we'll post on the website. But that's the study I covered and I just thought it was really fascinating. And it made me think about, I got thinking more generally about what are, what are some songs that I just think are oh, so sad and they always make me feel sad. And the one that mm. came to mind for me is, you know that song Mad World, the Gary Jules yes, version yes. from Donny Darko, not yes. the Tears for Fears version, the Gary Jules yeah, version. Yeah, that's Disney a really it. good example. Oh, he takes a completely song, different take on it. Yes. Um, I just think of John Lennon's Imagine, but that's more about the lyrics. But it's it's the sound as well. Mm. Mm. And then as far as happy songs go, he's one for you, Jenny, because I thought, <laughs> Sure, but I also thought of lots of songs by Wombats. You oh, yeah. love Wombats. And I think it's a really good example because yeah, that's often true. the music is quite happy, but the lyrics aren't. That's true. There's a lot of the sarcasm a lot of and cheeky irony what despair. And yeah. There's yes. a lot in their music about anxiety and depression and all these sorts of themes, but it's such upbeat pop yes. music. It's jump around and have a great time. Like let's dance to Joy Division. Yes, case you in don't point. realise. Exactly. <laughs> Put that one on the playlist. And Adding note. It is a good example because I, I don't know about you, Janine, but I don't actually pay a whole lot of attention to lyrics. I'm much more oh. focused on the music. Uh, I do. And that's where I get I my both. sense of enjoyment from a song. Even yeah. what my favourite song of all time, I don't really know what it's about. <laughs> and recently I was talking to Mel about what song I wanted to be played at my funeral. A bit morbid, but I was. And it's just a song that I love. It makes it so, mm. it just makes me feel lots of things. And it occurred to me that I'd never actually thought about what the lyrics were saying. What is the <laughs> song? You've never shared this with me. I'm not saying because, okay. it, no, it's not going to be my funeral song anymore because it's very clearly about a couple realising that they've fallen out of love and that they need oh. to break up. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, that's it's funny. just not appropriate Well, for it's a, a different type song. of ending. <laughs> but I never paid attention. It's all about the music. You don't do that. Yeah, no, you don't pay attention to lyrics. It's interesting. I didn't when I was younger, but I do now. If it has great lyrics, Mm. yeah. If it has great lyrics, for me, that's just a bonus. Well, if it has great lyrics and I happen to notice them, that's a bonus. Oh, yeah. (laughs) I'd generally be drawn in by the melody and the sound and then start engaging with what is this actually about. And I do a lot of um, rabbit holing about this. I try and find what did the... What did the musicians mean by these lyrics? What are other people's interpretations of it? I love doing that. Then think about what's my interpretation. Then mm. I go and look at well, what was their interpretation. And sometimes they just, they don't say. They'll say it's open to interpretation. It's for you to take what you want from it, which I yeah. love as well. Yeah. Well, that's annoying. Also, just hearing about your study because they focused on the Papua New Guinea 
peoples. There's an amazing book by Tim Flannery. Have you heard of Throw Him Way Leg? No. He is an Australian mammal researcher and this was, I think it was in the 80s or maybe 90s, he went and lived amongst the tribes and really embraced their culture and he was there for scientific research. But he's written this book about that. It's really, really, really interesting. I highly recommend that. I'm oh, great. All right, are you finished? <laughs> So, Janine, I was looking more so at how music affects our emotions Mm. and you're looking at how emotions affect the music that people create. That's right. So the paper that I'm focusing on is by Borowiecki and it was published in 2017 in the Review of Economics and Statistics. Now, let's just call it, my first thought here was what is a paper about music doing in an economics journal? Thankfully, the authors explain <laughs> this well straight up. Economists okay. are interested. They knew that that would be required. Yeah. Uh, economists are really interested in creativity because there are clear links between creativity and innovation, entrepreneurship, and job creation. And I'm like, oh, of course. Oh, of course. As we know, creative, talented people push boundaries and can even transform a culture. This may occur during their lifetime and continue after they die, or it could kick off sometime after they die. So then, what are some of the drivers of creativity? There is the role of education and training, of course, life experience. There are the cognitive thinking aspects to this. But what about the emotional drivers of creativity? And really here, this author is interested specifically in whether creativity can be born out of negative emotional states or mental illness. And, you know, we've, mm. we've sort of heard, this is out in the ether, right? There's a bit of an idea of this. For sure. Yeah. So this author is really getting into the whether there's any evidence for this. And coming back to economics, we all know how the state of the economy can impact directly or indirectly on our health and well-being. Oh, for sure. We'll look at the effect of the pandemic on people's mental health. Exactly, yes. Look, you know. the pandemic, case in point, the resulting economic chaos, particularly the impacts on the arts sector among many sectors. Mm. People working in the arts were not classed as essential workers, in Australia at least. We could have a whole episode discussing that. And just as a side note, when I was preparing my notes for this episode, I was just thinking about, think about all those artists that were on the cusp of their big break just in early 2020. What happened to those people? Yeah. You know, it's it's really, really sad. I hope that some of them managed to persevere and are able to pursue this artistic dream they may have. And I did want to share this line from the paper that speaks to this point. Without steady economic foundations, art cannot exist. And without creativity, the economy cannot thrive. Yes, it's not well recognised among um, governments and leaders. No, and I was... In many in many settings. And I mean, I was thinking of the... When lockdown started in Australia, I mean, what a time of upheaval. And what was one of the first things that you and I did? We created a pandemic playlist. Do you remember? We did. <laughs> yes, we, and that's right. We, and that was inject a little bit of fun and humour into this crazy time. And it was so helpful. So what did I go straight to? Mm. Music, books, television. I went straight to creative things to, yeah. to help. And I, so did most people. That playlist is great. It is really good. Let me, let me try and remember. It's funny. There's My Corona. <laughs> my Sharona. <laughs> which everyone may name My Corona. <laughs> Uh, wombats again, perfect disease. Yeah. Yes. Keep your hands to yourself. I remember putting that one on there. <laughs> Am I ever going to see your face again? <laughs> that's right. Oh, that's funny. Oh, and there was the, the police song. What is it? Dun, 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 dun. Oh, don't, don't stand, stand so, so close, close to me. To me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That really got me through. Honestly, that really helped in that time of great anxiety and all the unknowns. Okay, so here in this paper, the author is interested in whether there is a relationship between emotion and creativity and explicitly does a negative mental state lead to higher levels of creativity. So first, the author needed to get data around emotional state. The methods they used are really interesting. The author poured over 1,400 handwritten letters by three classical music composers, and these were Mozart, Beethoven, and Liszt, and these letters Mm. were written across their entire lifetime. And the author points out that that's why these three were chosen, because they did have access to data from across the lifespan, whereas some other composers, maybe it was 
not available earlier or not as consistently. Right. Wow. I know. Now, side note, apparently these letters are available electronically via the Gutenberg database. This is because the copyright has expired due to the age of these and many other things. And there are over 60,000 ebooks and resources available for free. So everyone who, like me, wants to go check this out, it's Project Gutenberg, and I will put a link up on the show notes. <laughs> wow, just in your spare time if you feel like reading thousands upon thousands of letters. That's right. Books, whatever you want. Go ahead. So, and it's going to be a lot of the classics will be there. So isn't that fantastic? All available for, all mm. available for free. Okay, so with these letters, the author completed a comprehensive linguistic analysis. You can go to the paper and read the finer details of this, but the main outcome was using a linguistic computer program to work out what extent of each letter had positive versus negative emotions. So it's quantifying that around the language. So, for example, okay. if there was some mention of something involving happiness... Or was there something mention of something involving some grief or some sadness? So they do that with all of the letters over time, right? So you end up with this longitudinal data set where we get a measure of happy data and sad da- data across each year of their life. And so you can see how their emotional state changes over time, at least in terms of what they're communicating to others. Cool. And because these three composers in particular are so well regarded and their lives are so well known, there is a lot of data around what was actually happening in those in their lives over time. So you can get some additional data around where you could, for example, quantify times of illness, maybe personal relationship issues, unexpected deaths that have happened in their among their friends and family, and happier mm-hmm. times where they may be really engaged and touring new music. Yeah, and really invade their privacy. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how we get this data around their emotional state. So then the next phase is needing to get some data around the levels of creativity over time. And the author describes that this was done by looking at the number of important quality musical compositions at different time points. There wasn't a lot more information about how this was done. And as I mentioned before, I'm not a musical expert, but I imagine it's quite well understood within musical circles which pieces by these musicians are their most creative, are their most groundbreaking. So, and also it's looking at the number, how many are they doing each year? Right. Okay. So what the author gets, and I would encourage people to go look at this paper. It's really cool. They get these really interesting graphs of these composers' emotions over time. Along the bottom, along the x-axis, they put the year and also the age of the composer. And then on the y-axis going up, they have a scale of the amount of positive emotions in one graph, and then they'll have a comparative graph next to that of negative emotions. Okay. So, yeah, so you can go and have a look at this. So they produce a negative emotion and a positive emotion graph for each of the three composers. So you end up with six graphs. And zooming in on Beethoven's results, his positive emotions really crash in his 20s and they just don't recover. And anyone familiar with Beethoven's life, it was very sad, difficult and troubled life from quite early on. Yeah. Yeah, so that was quite sobering to see that actually quantified. Whereas looking at lists, you sort of see the opposite trend. The positive emotions actually get better over time and their negative emotions drop later in his life. Mm. So good points of comparison there. So a few interesting findings before I get into the main finding. When the composers were actively travelling or touring their work, they generally had less negative emotions in their correspondence. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, when there was a death of a family member, that was hugely linked to negative emotion, so no surprises there. Uh, episodes of poor health also linked to negative emotional states. Interestingly, the composers wrote fewer letters when their emotions were positive. So we're not talking about their musical composition. We're talking about how much were they were writing to friends and family. They wrote yes. less. They wrote fewer letters when they were in a positive emotional state. And there was a correlation found between negative and positive emotions, which kind of makes sense. So at any given point in time, if their negative state was high, then their positive state was generally low. Makes sense. Yeah. This was a quite a, I found this quite funny, quite a funny finding, that getting a permanent position, so the equivalent of getting tenure, they were way less productive. (laughs) (laughs) I just found that funny. That so, you know, funny. were they resting on their laurels? I don't know. It's it, The author suggested they were probably consumed by 
other tasks that take you away from creativity. And I can think of a lot of people that I know who are battling with that issue. Yeah, the, Lots of the, can the relate quest to that. for permanency comes with its own challenges once it's received. Mm. Okay, so let's move into the big question. Overall, the author did find that more significant works were completed in phases of negative emotion. Okay. And really looking into that more deeply, there was evidence that important compositions were produced the year after a surge in negative emotions. But they're not necessarily, it wasn't that the creativity continued after that. So there is a suggestion that the creative process may actually help to, and I quote, burn down the negative emotions. Yes. Yeah. And then the author did something really interesting where they split the negative mood into different subtypes. They mentioned these three, anger, anxiety, and sadness. So everyone can understand they're all negative states, but they're quite different, right? Oh, yeah. And when doing that, the author was able to highlight that the main feeling driving bursts of creativity was sadness and or depression Mm -hmm. rather than anger or anxiety and other negative states. Yeah, so if it's sadness and depression and Mm. they're creating and, as you said, Mm. they're burning down, it's like emotional processing, right? It's like journaling. (laughs) Maybe. That's right. Mm. So what about on your graphs there? We know of some of Beethoven's famous, most Mm -hmm. well-known works. Whereabouts mm-hmm. do they slot on the graph? So Eroica, I think, is Beethoven's probably arguable, but considered Beethoven's most significant works. Yes, I believe that the Eroica Symphony is considered the best from what I was having a look at this myself. And that was written when he was aged 32. And looking at the graph now, which people can definitely go and see, that is when his positive emotions have already plummeted and flatlined and don't recover. Yeah, there's so been it, a good it, 10 it years does, of... It, yeah, well, sort of between mm, maybe around 24 to 30, they're plummeting, but once we get to 32, that's when it's got to the bottom and it doesn't mm. come back up. It yes. is interesting. It is interesting. There is more work needed to dissect the mechanisms at play. This paper doesn't go then into that. It's just pointing out the pattern. But... I think it does raise the idea that negative emotions do offer an opportunity for self-reflection, an opportunity to build resilience. And I was also thinking about the isolation and solitude that may come with these phases of sadness and or depression. Maybe that's part of it too. There's more time. There's an opportunity for creativity in that space. And, And of course, this idea that we've brought up that maybe some people or all people do need to engage creatively to get through these tough times. Maybe that is... Yeah, and we might all do that in different ways. That's right. I'm not going to compose classical music because I don't know how to do that, but I (laughs) I would be doing my own version of creative. You're doing macrame and collages. I'll do my collage. I do a lot of writing when I'm in a tub. A lot of journaling, a lot of writing, and it helps me so much. Yes. I listen to music, play my ukulele and or guitar. Yes. Journal. It's great. Mm. I did want to mention my beautiful I do have a symphony in the works. So do you? We'll we'll discuss that another time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> have I not oh, mentioned funny. that to you before, Janine? <laughs> <laughs> oh, a woman of many talents, my sister is. <laughs> <laughs> but I did want to to mention my beautiful friend in Perth, Nat, and uh, she had a really hi, awful. Nat. Hi, Nat. We love you, Nat. She had a really awful accident on her electric bike a few months ago. Um, Mm -hmm. And she broke several bones and it was really, really serious and a really long recovery time and a really difficult time because not able to do very much and in pain. It's so, so difficult, right? And as I said, so I'm in Brisbane, that's in Perth. We We were communicating a lot and just the way she was writing her messages to me was so beautiful and poetic. And I said, I hope you're writing some of this down. It's just stunning. It's like poetry. And she's like, really? And so she started to form some poetry and it was amazing. Mm. And we talked about, I wonder if that opportunity would have arisen if she hadn't had this accident, she hadn't had this difficult time 
to to get through. Mm. So I chatted to her the other day and asked, is, are you okay with me mentioning this? And she said yes. And she said she also would like to point out she did have a lot of time on her hands and she was on a lot of opiates. Oh, so yes. read into that Great. what you will. <laughs> <laughs> but so is she you, keeping up with it? Oh, I think she said she's got less time for it, but I think it's definitely planted a seed in her head that this is something that she she is great at. It, it is so yeah. good. Very good. Um, it's so good. So if we really think about coming back to the paper, these three composers, they've been pretty instrumental in shaping classical Western music, right? And their yeah. most creative outputs are written during f- or following negative emotional states, especially sadness or depression. So what can we take from this paper? Maybe to create the most creative stuff, seek out sadness and don't take a permanent job. (laughs) (laughs) No, I'm being silly. I would absolutely much rather be feeling optimistic and happy and not be creating stuff. Let's be real. (laughs) Sure. But no, what I think I really am going to take from this is to look towards creative pursuits during the most difficult phases of life because they're going to come. We know they're coming. We know they're coming. Use this as a way. Hopefully this will help to burn up those emotions, as was mentioned. And who knows what you might create and be remembered for? Who knows? Yeah. It might not be the Ninth Symphony, but it might help you regardless. (laughs) Or at least yeah, impress might, your friend. <laughs> it might become a family heirloom. You don't know. Yeah. And I did want to mention that I personally do find it very helpful to listen to sad pieces of music when I'm going through a sad time. And why is that? I think pretty obviously because someone else has been there and I feel less alone. It's helpful. Yeah, it's a form of, it's like soothing. It's comfort to mm. just be in that space when that's how you're feeling. Well, I think it's helping you rather than fight how you're feeling, accept how you're feeling and sit with it. I think that's part of it. That's right. Now, look, do I have a moment to just quickly mention another experiment that was mentioned in this paper that I found absolutely fascinating? Sure. (laughs) Thank you. I might cut it out. (laughs) Okay. Let's see if it makes it, everyone. Okay, so this was a 2008 study called The Dark Side of Creativity. I'll put a link up in the show notes if this makes the cut. This was a lab-based experiment. So important to point out that this paper that I focused on was was not an experimental study, right? But this is an experimental study. So here. Right. So here there were participants and they were assigned to three groups. There was a control group and two experimental groups and they were doing mock interviews. The control group just did an interview speech alone in a room, whereas the experimental groups did a interview speech to a panel and one of those groups was given negative feedback following and one of the groups was given positive feedback. So they're trying to manipulate their emotional state then and there, right? Mm-hmm. Then they were asked to do collages, which is my absolute favourite creative pursuit. <laughs> <laughs> it is. I love it. It's so easy and it's free. You just have to grab random bits of magazines and stick stuff. It's great. Anyway, so then they made these collages and then they had artists rate the collages in terms of creativity. And they were able to show that those who had received that negative feedback, which they interpreted as being socially rejected, showed much more creativity. So I thought that was worth bringing out. You can have potentially an immediate effect. So if you have a hard day at work and someone's a jerk to you, go home and do a collage and it's probably going to be awesome. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So that that wraps up what I wanted to talk about. Yeah, I know. It's really cool, right? That's why I hope this makes the cut. I think you'll agree I need to talk about that anyway. (laughs) It's pretty good. (laughs) Okay, so it's, of course, inner square time. And Janine, I've got a real return to the silly for me. You'll be glad to know. Okay. I'm going to go first because I'm just, I'm just ready. I'm ready right now. All right. So I recently saw the most hilariously funny looking dog breed. Oh. I saw it on TV. I think it was a commercial for something. I don't remember what it was for. Okay. So yay for me. Your marketing tactics clearly didn't work. Uh, No (laughs) idea what the ad was for. All I took from it was, holy crap, there's a dog that has dreadlocks. What? Yeah. So have you heard? Hang on. Hang on. Are these like manipulated? No. Let me finish. (laughs) Have you heard of the Hungarian Puli? No. Quick, look at this. Listeners, we're on Zoom, so I'm just going to... Are you sharing? I need to see this. 
I'm just going to show Janine the Hungarian pulley. Mm -hmm. Can you see this? (gasps) It looks like a mop. (laughs) Well, exactly. It looks like a mop head with legs and a tongue. (laughs) That's exactly what I, you stole my joke. So (laughs) squares, you really do need a visual on this. So just quickly go and Google. If you just type in dreadlock dog, you will see the Hungarian pulley. (laughs) So go ahead and do that. And while you do that, I'll tell you that this is a highly intelligent working dog. This is what I learned from doing my inner Mm. square. They have been bred for herding and protecting flock. They have been around for a long time. This is an ancient dog breed, which is why I was surprised that I didn't know more about them. So as you'll see, they have this corded woolly coat that will grow all the way to the ground. It basically looks like long dreadlocks. They are gorgeously hysterical. And so, yes, I spent some time reading about the Hungarian Puli and I just had to share that with you all. And, yeah, it's basically like if a dog was a mop head, as Janine said. So, but I'm bringing this full circle because... Janine, do you know yes. where you will have seen this dog breed before? No. No. I thought I had seen it and it was on something you owned. Do you recall your what? hard copy of the Bush album 16 Stone? <gasps> yes. The inside cover and also the CD on some editions pictures Gavin Rossdale's Hungarian Pooley from okay. whatever, whenever this album was released in 1994. Mm-hmm. So Gavin Rossdale, lead singer of Bush, had okay. a Hungarian pulley and I have oh, it wow. on semi-good authority, i.e. I read it on Wikipedia, <laughs> that his name was Winston. Okay. My name is Dog is Winston. Oh, that's funny. So look here. I do I'm remember that now that you've placed again. that in my brain, I can actually look, picture that album. Look, here it is. Do you remember this? Yeah. That's a dog. I didn't know I didn't, what this was yeah. at, at the no, time. I, didn't I just either. I thought that was some sort of snuffleupagus S- type character. I thought it was some sort of um, yeah character up on the stage. <laughs> there you go. That's Gavin Rossdale's Hungarian Pooley. Yeah, so now that we've talked about 16 Stone on the podcast, I would like you to add my favourite song already from did that, that album. I have already Thank added you. that. Thank you very much. <laughs> you don't need to tell me. <laughs> Good. I'm going to nerd out later to look into the history of this Hungarian pulley. You mentioned it was very ancient, so I'll be interested to know if it has been bred by humans to have those traits or if it had those initially because I want to know what these traits of having a head that looks like a mop, what, what's going on there? The whole body looks like a mop. I want to know what these, what the selection pressures have been in you terms of evolution. You have to look at a picture of them running. You can't actually I, see I want to know. which, end, I need to which know. end is where. It's just <laughs> yeah. like... Imagine you're shaking a mop up oh, in the funny. air. It's just crazy. That's funny. All right. Are we ready for my inner square? Go. My inner square is that I've recently come across a term, a Japanese term called tsundoku. And Alina, this is acquiring reading materials but letting them pile up in one's home without reading them. And I just <laughs> went, this is... I really relate to this concept and I've and read a few things people about do. this. Like, I love when other languages have terms for complex behaviours like this. Mm. And you go, oh. And so one of the articles I read in Literary Hub, which is a great, great website to follow if people are interested in literature and reading, and this article is by Antoine Wilson. It's very funny. I would recommend people have a look at that. I will put a link up. Some of the favourite quotes from here was, instead of castigating myself over new purchases or for not clearing enough shelf space for the books I already have or for any other venal book acquiring skin, I just tell myself that I'm practising Sundoku. (laughs) (laughs) That's not a pile, it's a Sundoku. (laughs) Yes. Uh, I really relate to this. So um, in preparation for the episode, I went around and counted. I have 23 books around my house that... I've been purchased or I've been on loan from the library. <laughs> I haven't quite started. Mm-hmm. And they are my, that is my Sundoku practice. Mm. And it's I'm really of, good it's at a it. Bit of, it's a, kind of a bit of hoarding behaviour, isn't it? 
No, Alina. It's I've Sundoku. seen you at a bookshop, Janine. I've seen you at a bookshop. <laughs> well, the books the, that the you The library wore. is even worse because there's no purchase involved. Oh, yeah, I've seen it's you. It's really, at a bookshop really bad. Or, and a library. Yep. But it's, it's my Sundoku practice. <laughs> and I'm really, really getting really good at it. Well, you're doing really <laughs> well with it. Thank you. I know. Thank you for that. Well, look, if anyone out there wants some tuition in how to practice their Sundoku, get in touch. I'm a pro. Oh, Janine's the best. She can help you out with that. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us. Details of everything we've talked about will be available on our website. Follow along on Facebook, Twitter and the Gram and we'd love to connect with you. And if you like listening to Sister Dr Squared, please buy us a coffee via our Ko-fi page. The link for that is on the Support Us page of the website. And if any squares out there would like to leave us a review, we would really appreciate it. It helps more people find the podcast and have a sense of what it's all about. And I did want to read this awesome review from Kalengo too. Alina and Janine are extremely enthusiastic and so much fun to listen to. Their endless interest in science is contagious and the episodes constantly get me interested in random things that I have never thought about. I'm always anxiously waiting for the next episode. Yay! Thank you, Kalengo too. Thank you, Kalengo too. Yay! There have been several times where people have used the word random when describing our podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a pretty good descriptor, actually. In the yeah, best possible sure. way. Thanks. <laughs> All right, that's it for now. Thanks, everyone. See you next time. Stay square out there. Bye. Bye.